Wonderful. Um, yes, so hello everyone. I think we can um, kick off um, this uh, session on interpretability and uh, explainable AI. Um, Monica uh, Krebel and myself, my name is Christian Ledig. We're gonna uh, chair this session and uh, we are very much looking forward to nine exciting papers covering important topics and a wide range in this domain, including papers on out of distribution detection, uncertainty estimation, um, exactly. So I think without further ado, let me briefly summarize. We're gonna have uh, three groups of three speakers each. Every speaker will give a brief introduction of uh, him or herself and their respective work for one and a half minutes. And after each uh, group, we will pause and um, pose uh, questions that we collected prior to this session or uh, questions that will be um, collected via the chat function now in this uh, session. So please uh, do not hesitate and share any questions you might have here on, on the chat. Um, otherwise, um, our technical chairs will go through the respective slides. So there's uh, no need for the individual speakers to share their screen. Otherwise, for any questions we're not getting to in this session, please uh, feel free to meet the authors directly at the poster session later in the afternoon. So without um, a further delay, I would say we start with a uh, paper G1 and have uh, Guang Hui uh, Fu um, kicking us off. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Guang Hui Fu, and today I will introduce our research. Michael Computer version is an important topic due, due to the various real life applications. Many researchers try to improve performance, but they're still not truly understanding of what neural network learn and how decisions are make it. Because of the tree structure, decision tree related model can visualize the decision process, but their performance is often not as good. Standard explainable CV model indeed of visualization by using attention mechanism, but we do not know the decision process. Some research combine them together, and we are inspired by the neural back and decision tree model, which can improve accurate and interpretability. In this work, we propose a model called MENDT that both visualizes the decision process and decision basic. It consists of standard CNN model and make decision basic on a medical temple and a clarification bench. First, we use uh, the pre-trained CNN model and defend the medical temple according to the anatomical position relationships. Then we combine the temple and the clarification bench and retrain the whole network together. Finally, we visualize the Selenic map and generate the report. This model is trained with three laws, standard laws, standard clarification laws, and the pass and the note laws. We observe that the MENDT output from all the baseline will require fewer parameters. Specify, we observe the dark knot report of Burn City and find that MENDT accurate indicator error of interest will correctly predict the, the disease. And thank you for your attention. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Kong Hui. Um, is there a speaker here from paper uh, three two? Uh, I I don't know the speaker from G two. Sorry. Yeah. Um, th thank you. I, I I think it was a, a general uh, a question. If uh, we if we don't have a speaker here from paper G two, then I suggest we move on to paper G uh, three to. Uh, Lasse Hansen, and we can back, uh, get back to paper G2 later. Yeah, I, I just see the uh, speaker might have had uh, trouble joining, so we, we do uh, paper G2 in the end. So Lasse Hansen, uh, please. Yeah, hi everyone, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, loud and Great. clear. Okay. Uh, yeah, my name is Lasse. I'm working as a PhD student uh, at the lab of Matthias Heinrich here at the University of Lübeck, and I'm currently wrapping up my thesis. And today I'm presenting our short paper for Middle 2021 titled uh, Radiographic Assessment of CVC Mail Positioning. How can AI best support clinicians? And this is a joint work with colleagues from the Department of Radiology at the University Hospital Lübeck and Philips Research in Hamburg. And in this work, we investigate the problem of male positioning of central venous catheters or short CVCs, which is a common technical complica complication that is 
usually diagnosed on post-procedure chest X-rays. And if the misplaced CVC remains undetected, it can lead to serious health consequences for the patients. So we want to help the clinicians by classifying misplaced CVCs at a large scale. However, final calls are always be made by the clinician. So we put a strong focus on explainability in our evaluation. And in total, we evaluated three different approaches. Uh, the first one, a simple baseline where we trained a neural network to classify a, a chest X-ray if it contains a normal or an uh, abnormal position CVC. And we got uh, okay results. Uh, we, we measured this as mean AUC um, of 0 0.85. Um, then we, we also had uh, segmentation information available. So we trained another neural network that outputs these uh, segmentation uh, results, the, the CVC itself and the target region, and um, then use the classifier to, to tell the clinician, uh, is it placed uh, normal or abnormal? And uh, this, of course, uh, increased the AUC and uh, also the explainability, as the clinician can, can also have a look at the uh, segmentation results. And then uh, we, we also try to directly use the segmentation uh, output and uh, ha have just a rule-based method that uh, looks is the, is the CVC tip inside the target region. And, um, and, and then this gives us the result. And uh, yeah, fortunately, this gives us the best result and the best explainability. So we think this is a, this is a great uh, method to use. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to, to answer any questions uh, here or later at the poster. Thanks. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Lasse. Um, I think the, the uh, speaker of uh, paper uh, G2 just uh, uh, joined us, so maybe we can actually go, uh, go back and uh, have a uh, chair, uh, Bas, um, talk about uh, this work. Hello? Oops. Yeah. Um, Hello, chair. We can hear you. Yeah, perfect. Hi. Hi, yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks everyone for coming to the session. So my name is Sharon, just a bit of introduction about me. So I did my PhD at Imperial College London in neurotechnology and then continued to do my postdoc in medical imaging and deep learning at King's College. So right now I'm working at medical startup called um, Panekia Technologies and we're working on cancer detection. So today I'll be presenting a paper I worked on at King's College. Um, so the paper is about being able to analyze uh, 3D medical data sets in which the goal is a continuous prediction. So that is a regression task. So in this paper, our goal is to um, be able to explain an image and a prediction using a feature map, um, which highlights relevant areas of an image for explanation. So how do we do this? Um, so yeah, we can see it in this slide. Um, so as we can see, our approach is using a generative method um, including encoders, generators, and discriminators. So we map an input image into two latent spaces using the encoders, and we use that latent space for prediction, and in addition, use them to generate uh, new images and feature maps. Um, so just a quick overview of what the method can achieve is in the next slide. Um, if I don't know how we can go to the next slide. Uh, okay, well, anyway, um, so what we can do is plot uh, feature maps related to the image, and we can even compare two images via translation and interpolation to further explain features related to the image. And yeah, thanks for listening and looking forward to answering your questions. Great, Th thank you very much, Chair. So we have uh, around five minutes for questions to this uh, first uh, group of, of papers. Maybe we start with a question for, um, uh, for, for for Lasse, um, so this was paper G3. So um, the question was uh, from one of the study groups around uh, misclassified cases. Like, do you have a hypothesis for common patterns of um, failure modes, or what are the main failure modes for those uh, that you observed? And yeah, how would you address yeah. them? Yeah, we, we we saw this from the from the segment uh, from the segmentation outputs uh, mainly that uh, that are yeah. CVC tips that are that are really small and hard to detect uh, that we could not uh, segment good enough and um, especially the the abnormal cases and uh, that might be to to our uh, data set that there are too 
yeah, to to few um, abnormal cases in in our data set, and we would yeah address this by by adding adding more of them. Thank you. Um, a, a paper, a, a question for for a chair uh, that uh, came up from one of the study groups as well. Um, and the question was, uh, how many samples would you uh, typically uh, require or ideally have uh, to to obtain this feature feature attribution and, and train that? So um, actually, you only need like a single image to get the feature maps. But what you do is actually, if you wanted to achieve um, translation, what you could do is you could just sample the latent space. So if you sample that about like a hundred times or something, you can get the mean and variance maps for that. But you only need like a single image as input. Um, alternatively, if you wanted to achieve like direct translation between two images, then you would require two images. And then you can achieve translation between them and then plot like basically the difference between them as a feature map. Thank you. Maybe a, a quick follow up question um, re relate to your paper, uh, uh, Chair. This uh, paper was a, a pretty, uh, by nature, short uh, version of, of your work. Um, is there sort of ongoing work and, and, and maybe a more comprehensive, uh, elaborate uh, a detail of, of this yes. work available somewhere yeah, or in progress? Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's available on archive under the same name. So yeah, just uh, have a look at that is all the details on that. And also we're submitting to IEEE, so hopefully it will be on that as well. Great, thank you. Then we have a question for uh, Guanghui uh, Fu. Um, and the question there is uh, from the chat. Um, do you, could you comment on whether the explainability is a uh, you think linked to the feature vector in the decision tree or perhaps more to the CNN itself? Uh, in our model, the uh, the decision process is private by the the decision tree, the tree structure, and the, the, dec the decision basic is private by the CNN model. Thank you. Maybe a follow up from the study uh, groups. Um, could you comment on the computational load that is added by using this tree, like both uh, re compute resource wise, but also uh, time for inference wise, for example? Is that, yeah? Yes, yes. Of course, we do the experiment by, to compare whether we use the, the, the tree structure or, or not, or the clarification batch. And uh, we train the, uh, in, in our model, we train it together, train the clarification and the tree batch together. Uh, but in the evaluation time, we ignore the clarification batch. And uh, and, uh, and this clarification batch is just for accelerating the coverage and improve the performance. We do the, the, we do the experiment. And uh, uh, more importantly, we found that with the clarification batch, we did not add too many parameters. But uh, the performance is slightly Im improved, so in, I keep it in our final final version. Great. Uh, all right. Uh, then uh, thank you very much to the uh, group of the first speakers again. I think we'll move on to the uh, second group of three, and um, exactly uh, Monica yeah. will lead it. I think the next next speaker is ha Han Seng Lee. Is he here? Yes, I already joined. Can you listen to me? Uh, yes, we can hear you, but not see you. All right, thank you. Uh, uh, hello, my name is Hansang E. And today I will be presenting the results of my preliminary work on test time mix of augmentation for uncertainty estimation in skin lesion diagnosis. So the uncertainty in machine learning is a measure indicates how likely the prediction is incorrect. So one of the representative methods for uncertainty estimation is the test time augmentation. So we try to observe how uncertainty behaves when the mix of augmentation is applied instead of the affine augmentation to this test time augmentation method. So in our test time mix of augmentation, the test data is first augmented by the mix of augmentation with a separate data sample from the training classes. And the uncertainty is then estimated as the entropy of the class histogram for the predictions of the mix of augmented data. 
So this test time examination certainly provides the instability of the prediction caused by the stronger perturbation caused by the mix of augmentation than the conventional offline augmentation. In our experiments on a skin lesion diagnosis data set, we observed that in a histogram of uncertainty, the test time augmentation sh shows that the correct and incorrect samples are overlapped even at the zero uncertainty as shown in the histogram on a top. Uh, but our test time mix of augmentation has a clear region where only correct samples are distributed in the low uncertainty period. So we can say that the test time mix of augmentation uncertainty has better separation between a correct and incorrect samples than a test time alpha and augmentation. So for information, uh, please visit my posture. Thank you. Thank you, Hansen. Uh, I think the next speaker for G5 is Kaya. Hi, Kayan. Uh, we can't hear you, sorry. Now you are muted. Uh, can others hear him? Maybe it's just me. I, I, I cannot hear you uh, either, Kayan. Maybe something in the settings you may find. Um, what should we do? Shall we, shall we see to to uh, move, maybe move on to the next speaker to Polina and see if we can um, yeah. Kian, have your presentation at the end? Yeah, I think that will be good. Yeah. Polina, are you here already? Uh, hey, so it is Yekaterina, the second author, and. Mm -hmm. If I'm not mistaken, we should be G6. Uh, G, G mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Sorry for confusion. Uh, you will find me near to G6. And uh, shall I start? Yes, yes. Okay. Go so, ahead. expected that uh, you should be careful training models on data with weak labels. For example, building pathology classification models on brain MRI data. And you better to explore the model attention and learn patterns. So how do we get to middle this year? Um, we basically just showed how the model can overfit. And we choose the easiest recognition problem on healthy subjects. So classification, men uh, and women. And if you can go to the third slide, be just nice. It's not ours, but I see. Uh, so we show that models trained on raw data with no preprocessing will be overfitting on Adam's apple, classifying men from women. Uh, so nothing about the brain. And model on skull strip data will be learning only brain sizes. And if you want to force the model to find the differences within the brain structure, we propose the data augmentation based on the optimal transport to force model to learn the not that obvious patterns and not to overfit on them. So how do you suppose to use uh, our findings on your research? Well, you can check if your pathology model on weak labels is not actually overfitted on gender or age related differences. And you can ask for on G6 poster. Thank you. Uh, should we try uh, G, uh, G5 once again? Yeah. 
Hi, Kian. I think you are muted. Yeah, try speaking something. Okay, maybe I can say quickly uh, one or two sentences about the paper uh, and then we can move to um, discussion uh, section, right? Um, so this, this is a nice paper about, uh, about using, a, uh, using a simple model, uh, using uh, features from uh, what I understand, we're using features from uh, landmark from landmarks, and they learn these uh, features from landmarks based on just single label data. So instead of uh, training a model, training a CNN on the whole image, what they do is they extract features from specific landmarks, which were which are uh, decided by clinical knowledge. And they train simple SVM on, on those features, and they find that it, it gives uh, equally a, uh, equal performance to a CNN trained on the full data. I think I got it somewhere closer. I hope uh, 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 the participants have uh, read the paper and they have uh, some questions already. Should we move on? Uh, we can now move on to the uh, to the uh, question answer round. I will start with G four. I have a question from the which was posted in the uh, study groups uh, for G four. Uh, the question is: How would you communicate uncertainty to users? So right now, how would uh, uh, the values? What? How would you uh, tell them to users? What would they mean? Handsome. Oh, sorry. So, what was the question? Uh, sorry, uh, I, uh, I I will repeat it again. Um, so, the question is, uh, how would you interpret? Uh, how would you te uh, tell the uncertainty values to a user? So, what what is the uncertainty values that you find? What do they mean to a user? For example, for probability, we can say one means that it has maximum probability. Zero means it has zero. So what do oh, the values so, mean to a user? Yeah, so the so the uncertainty is uh, kind of uh, provides the information on the instability of the predictions when the data has perturbed. So mm -hmm. we we want we want a we want to observe when the data is observed with the more aggressive perturbation like the mix up augmentation, then then how the uncertainty behaves, how the uncertainty, how the uncertainty does shows. So, so, so to observe, we we have applied the mix of augmentation and test time, and uh, measure the uncertainties. And we have observed the uh, uh, the uncertainty values distributed high, uh, normally higher than the. When a, when a basic test time augmentation uncertainty and uh, and not only the the total data uncertainty we we can we can additionally we can additionally measure the uncertainty between the date between a one test data and a and a specific class data because we because in mix up the augmentation we can mix the data with the specific class data. So when we when we when we measure the uncertainty between a test data and a specific class data, we call the we call them the class specific uncertainty. Then we can obtain the information of the class distance information, which the classifier learned, and 
from the class specific uncertainty, we we think. So that that was that was the meaning of the uncertainty we have proposed. Thank you, Hansen. And I think he, uh, we can try once again Hello. if Hello. Kian, Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes. Oh yeah. great, great. Uh, Sorry uh, about that. Yeah, so can we can we try once again if if Kayan can uh, present his uh, uh, his paper? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, hello, mm -hmm. everyone. I'm Kayan from Pierre Bethesda Research Lab. Uh, the interpretability of deep networks is critical for clinicians to trust the prediction results. Specifically, it is important that the network's attention is on the correct body part. Network realization algorithms have been used to generate attention maps, but the results are implicit and uncontrollable. A better method is to explicitly specify relevant body parts using clinical prior knowledge, and then guide the network to learn from these regions. We can train another organ segmentation or landmark detection model, but it may require many labeled samples. A recent algorithm called self-supervised anatomical embedding, or SAM, can be used to detect arbitrary anatomical landmarks with only one labeled sample needed. We explore to use SAM in the task of contrast phase classification in dynamic liver CT. We use SAM to detect 32 phase-related landmarks such as the aorta or portal vein, and then extract the bounce field units of these landmarks to train an SVM classifier. This simple idea outperforms a sophisticated CNN classifier trained on the whole image, meanwhile being more interpretable and more robust. The only cost is manually labeling 32 points on one random patient as guidance. Thank you. Thank you, Kian. And I think we can uh, directly go to a question for you. There is a question in the chat uh, for, uh, for you, which is, how are the results comparing the methods uh, based on CAM? So uh, did you do a comparison with CAM and how do uh, they compare? Oh, I didn't compare the results with SAM uh, because mm -hmm. uh, with CAM because our, our method is uh, totally different from CAM. Uh, CAM is when you train a image classifier and then CAM can realize how the network sees the image, uh, which part is the uh, attention or which part is highlighted. But as our method, we directly guide the net get the uh, classifier to learn from certain uh, from certain uh, image regions because we just detect the interest point and then train a SVM on the point of the HU values. So these are two different kind of methods. So I think it may not be comparable. Yeah, true. Uh, well, thank you, Kian. And I think uh, we, we have a question for G6. Uh, this was also asked in the study groups. Um, uh, the question is, uh, how have you controlled for potential biases when rescaling men to women? And did you expect this high validation accuracy between uh, classifying male and female brains? Well, yeah, it was the reason uh, for choosing this particular task because mm -hmm. it has classification accuracy up to 100. And mm -hmm. while it's overfitted on Adam's apple, it's 100%. Like, okay. It, but uh, if we are forcing model to choose not that obvious features for learning, it is something near to, so it's still really high. So we're not about to tackle with this um, yeah, no noisy labels. So the tasks seem to be very uh, straightforward. Yeah, thank you. Um, should we, uh, should we, uh... I think, yeah, it's right time. We can now move on to the third session and the, and the third group of the session. Um, there, there were a couple of more questions in, in the chat for also uh, papers G4, G5, G6. So I encourage everyone to uh, visit the virtual posters uh, later in the afternoon um, and speak to the authors directly. So now we move on to G7 with uh, Kang Ning Liu. Hey. Hey. So hello, everyone. My name is Kang Ning Liu. So I'm currently a PhD student at NYU Center for Data Science. So interoperability is uh, important for applying different methods to clinical applications. 
In some medical applications, so interpretability can be achieved by localizing the tumors. Yet chaining a fully supervised segmentation or localization model requires pixel-wise supervision, which is uh, very expensive and sometimes even not possible. And under such circumstances, weekly supervised localization methods can highlight the most influential regions less responsible for the prediction, utilizing only each level labels and are very popular. However, most of methods for weekly supervised localization are designed for natural images or medical images with the similar resolution, which is like 500 multiple 300. But for some medical applications, the resolution can be very high, such as mammography images, the resolution can be as high as like 3,000 multiple 2,000. So it, for the traditional methods produce two cold localization results due to the memory, GPU memory constraints for very aggress aggressive downsampling and it could not provide very precise localization for the tumors that are quite small compared to the overall images. So in this paper, we uh, propose to obtain fine-grained segmentation in a weekly surface manners uh, with like in only image level labels, and we try to combine the insights from the weekly surface learning and multiple instance learning. Yeah, thanks. So I'm ha very happy to answer any questions that, that you may have during the first session. Thank you. Um, let's move on to next speaker, uh, paper G8, um, Matthäus Hare. Yeah. Marking that this is sort of like equating or being the same sort of uh, task as of out of distribution detection, um, just by the very nature of it. And uh, for example, if you um, check the diagram on the right side, so when you, for example, would uh, train on Camp P2 and you would test on an out of distribution data set, which might hold lesional or non lesional sample, then you cannot really tell the difference anymore. And um, so the, the message is very simple. While while the method itself is, is very promising, and you don't have to label a large amount of data, um, it's actually um, it, it might actually be very vulnerable to um, some sort of domain shifts or um, when you when you are looking for those lesions. So uh, yeah, simple message, and and happy to have further discussions in the post session. Thank you, uh, Matthias. Um, then we have a paper at G9 presented by Hong Rung Sang. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, I have a problem with the camera driver with my, my operation system. So I, I cannot share the camera. Uh, is that okay with you? No problem, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. So, hello, I'm, I'm Hong Rung Sang from Univers University of Liverpool. And I present our paper about the localization term for slight correlation reduction in host line image analysis with the deep learning. Uh, host line images are, are very large image and usually have a size up to 100,000 by 100,000. And therefore, the smallest units to be processed for deep learning model are, are those patches cropped from those host line images. And however, patches from the same slide uh, usually have highly similarity in terms of appearance, uh, pigment, and morphology. Um, but this share feature may not be relevant for uh, diagnosis, and therefore, as a result, it could deteriorate rate, uh, generalized ca generalization capability of our trend model. To relieve this issue, we propose we propose a very intuitive and easy to implement solution that is to directly reduce the correlation among the learned feature of, of patches from the same slide in order to improve the generalization capability of our train model. And it, it's implemented by adding the regularization term to, uh, to regular loss functions. 
and we expect uh, the, this proposed localization term is feasible in weather application, and this is what we are doing now. Thank you. I'm happy to answer uh, to further for further discussion. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Hongrun. Um, so we go into the question phase of uh, group number three. Um, we we'll look at the chat there. And so maybe we start with a question from the study group for uh, Kangning uh, Liu, um, where the question was um, around the averaging of the saliency maps. Um, um, I believe the, the the choice was to sort of um, average them unweighted, and the question was basically whether you've explored any weighted averaging or what the rationale was behind um, this uh, unweighted averaging. So we do have this operational study actually in the appendix for the simple weighted average. We uh, explore the hyperparameter that can be chosen to combine the visual maps. Yeah, and do show some trade off between different uh, type of lesions. Yeah, so the reason that we uh, compile the unweighted average in the map paper is that we want to keep our methods more simple, uh, simple, yeah, just to be like light. And we uh, we want to uh, emphasize like, uh, like the simple unweighted average may not be the best option. And perhaps there are other methods than average, maybe takes the maximum or using some other uh, learned methods to combine these, uh, these special maps, yeah. Uh, great, thank you. Maybe a follow-up question for the same paper, also from one of the study groups that relates to the joint uh, training of the, of this problem, where um, it seems you're selecting some top patches before going into the uh, fine step. And the question was how you would select those patches while keeping the optimization problem differentiable in an end-to-end -end way, or whether this affects this, um, or how and how you would uh, deal with that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good question. So, uh, like for our methods, we actually try to channel them in a, like in a progress way. So we find that the localization without explicitly pixelized supervision is kind of unstable because it's weak supervised. We only have in image level labels for the whole images. So what we do is that we first channel grow modules to apply to the whole images, and then we have a very close localization map. So it's kind of close and could not provide a precise localization. But it's, it's enough for providing some things for extracting the key patches that may contain the lesions. And then we, uh, we narrow down scope and we have another like networks to extract some uh, high resolution information from there. So currently, the least uh, selection procedure is not differentiable. Yeah, it's changed from, uh, I, I would say, stage, stage wise. And it's a very promising direction to use some maybe reinforcement learning methods to challenge from end to end. Yeah. Th Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, a, a question for uh, Hongrun uh, Sang. The question there was, um, could you comment on the, the prevalence of the uh, 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 one positive slides in your WSI uh, uh, images and uh, how would those, this, those instance rates affect the splits that you uh, chose? Oh, sorry, can, can you repeat the uh, question again? Yeah, um, how many uh, positive slides uh, do you have in, in, in the data set? What is the incidence of those? And how would the incidence of the positive slides affect the split that you use to train your model? Uh, yes, we, we currently, we, we, uh, we, we uh, vetted our best on one, uh, 184 84 slides. And for those, we have the 140 slides for training and the, uh, including validation and the rest for the uh, past. So uh, by, by far, this is now a very high number of slides, but, but uh, uh, the, the model can work well on the, the approach, uh, the algorithm can work well on, on this, uh, not so big, uh, but not so, not so small uh, data set. And we also have a uh, apply uh, validates on the on a much larger and much uh, popular data set that is the camera system, and we have added the uh, result on uh, appendix. And it, it seems that our our, uh, our 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 proposed algorithm um, is able to improve the the base light. And though uh, that data set has uh, about four hundred slides, 
So uh, for for the small da smaller data set uh, and uh, even for the larger data set, uh, uh, our uh, algorithm and well. Great, thank you. Maybe a brief follow up question to for that paper as well. So it seems you sort of downscaled the resolution from um, to 256 to 256. I was wondering, um, or this was one of the questions from the study groups, what would be required to um, operate at a higher resolution like 1K by 1K? Uh, uh, we have tried different, uh, uh, we, we uh, basically if we use 1K by 1, 1K and then thousand sample to 256 by 256 now. So this uh, is equivalent to 10 times magnification, and we have tried in our previous work, we have tried different magnification, magnification, uh, and we seems that uh, 10 times, uh, 10, 10 times magnification uh, were the best for for can achieve the best result uh, for both the the uh, perception, vision, or, or for the uh, efficiency of the, the, uh, uh, the of the 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 uh, model so so we we, we just say uh, try to or the uh, try this uh, magnification thank you great Th thank you very much um uh, one question for uh, paper g8 from mateus um it seems that the the method was uh, applied to slices to detect um, out of distribution samples on a slice level um could you comment on how this um, is sort of extended into a, a, a a data sample to, to the volumetric uh, level. Um, how is that combined um, and what options do we have there? Uh, yeah, so uh, exactly. So we did the work actually on a, on a per slice level. Um, we checked actually at the at the very end also um, how sort of consistent um, the detections are sort of like when you slice through the brain. So I think you could um, you could actually extend it and possibly, I don't know, in, in like detecting really like those OD slices, maybe not gain too much because it looks rather consistent when you actually slice through the brain. So that would be that would be my my initial thought on on this on this third task. Great, thank thank you very much, Matthias, and thank you very much to all the speakers from group number three. I'll uh, give it to Monica for some closing remarks. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, thank you very much for attending again. And uh, there is announcement for all the participants. All the papers are also available in the poster room. So do not forget to join the uh, speakers there. And I see there are lots of questions that were asked in the chat. And there are some questions that were left out from the study group. So please follow up with the authors and discuss with them in the poster room. Thank you.